Two hours up Interstate 85 from Atlanta is Furman University, summer home of Atlanta's football Falcons. In 1973, the sweat and strain of a South Carolina summer forged a winning pro football team. Well, this is where Coach Norm Van Brocklin assembled all the elements of the most successful season in the eight-year history of the Atlanta Falcons. The opening of the NFL season meant three consecutive road games for Atlanta. The first of them in New Orleans, where the season's first score resulted from the all-around efforts of fullback Art Malone, number 25. Together, Art Malone and his running mate Dave Hampton accounted for a total of more than 200 yards. But the big surprise was number 11, quarterback Dick Shiner, who started the season by leading the Falcons to almost 500 yards worth of total offense against the seemingly disorganized Saints. Another big opening day story was number 82, wide receiver Ken Burrow, who caught a pass for an apparent touchdown, only to have the play nullified by a penalty. Not to be denied, Burrow caught two other touchdown passes, which did count on the scoreboard. In the late stages of the game, there were foreshadowings of things to come. As a former Minnesota Viking quarterback named Bob Lee entered the game and connected on four of seven passes. In all, the Falcons broke or tied 35 team records as they rolled up the most points and their most one-sided victory ever, 62 to seven. There was no way anyone in New Orleans could have been prepared for the kind of opening day new coach John North and his Saints had awaiting them. Archie Manning did deliver a touchdown pass to Bill Butler. But for the rest of the day, Archie and his replacement, Bob Davis, had a somewhat difficult afternoon. Lord Humphrey and his Atlanta Falcon friends had an old-fashioned southern picnic. Running back fumbles and intercepting passes, six in all, one for a lightning score by cornerback Tom Hayes. And then there was number 11, semi-forgotten taxi man Dick Shiner. Art Malone was devastating with a downfield pass or with a goal line blast. But last week, Dick Shiner's favorite Falcons were his wide receivers, one of them Wes Chesson, number 81. Dick Shiner's other wide receiver was dangerous Ken Burrell, a master of the delayed spike. One score was called back, but on two other occasions, Shiner made sure that Burrow could demonstrate his spiking versatility. In all, 10-year veteran Dick Shiner hit on 13 of 15 passes and three touchdowns. Thirty-eight points later, Shiner was replaced by number 19, Bob Lee, who completed four of seven. The final touchdowns were credited to unsung names like Eddie Ray and Joe Prophet. Despite six fumbles and two missed field goals, the Falcons still managed almost 700 yards in total offense and an eighth consecutive victory over New Orleans, 62 to seven. Week two found the Falcons in Los Angeles, where after scoring their most points ever in the opener, they scored their least ever as the revamped Rams shut out the Falcons 31 to nothing. 
Week three brought a Monday night game in Detroit, where the Falcons again came up with no touchdowns and another embarrassing defeat, this time on national television. After three consecutive weeks on the road, the Falcons finally got to play one in Atlanta. In the Falcons' home opener, the San Francisco 49ers could score only one touchdown. But for the third straight week, the Falcons could score none. The 49ers won 13 to 9, and after one month of the season, the Falcons were 1 and 3 and tied for last place in the NFC West. With an offense that had not scored a touchdown in eight quarters, the Falcons' firepower seemed to have been reduced to their ability to kick field goals. Under that glaring flaw, the Falcons took the 49ers on to settle a question of second place in the NFC West. Coming off a bitter 40-20 reminder by the Los Angeles Rams that division title number four wasn't going to be a cakewalk, the 49ers found the Falcons hadn't forgotten their defensive fundamentals. With San Francisco ahead by a field goal early in the second quarter, John James' punt was taken by number 45, Ralph McGill, and returned to the Atlanta eight-yard line. McGill's run back was nothing new to Atlanta fans, as against them last year, he tied an NFL record for nine returns with 109 yards. Two plays later, Vic Washington cruised into the Atlanta goal for the game's only touchdown and a 10-0 lead. But with Nick Mickemeyer blasting field goals from 42 and 46 yards, Brody and company were hard-pressed to maintain the lead especially under the furious Atlanta Rice, led by consensus All-Pro Claude Humphrey, number 87. The lead was reduced to four points by the middle of the last period when Dave Hampton set Mick Meyer up for another boot to make it San Francisco 13, Atlanta 9. The frustrated Falcons almost came back, but with fourth and one and almost a minute to go on the San Francisco 19, they failed on the big play. For the plummeting Falcons, they meant a tie for last place. And for the 49ers, who lost two of their best running backs in the contest, it should prove to be an ill-remembered 13-9 victory. In the season's fifth week, Number 19, Bob Lee, was given his first start at quarterback for the Falcons, and he made the most of the opportunity. Number 43, halfback Dave Hampton, immediately became one of Lee's favorite receivers. And it was Hampton who scored Atlanta's first touchdown in 13 quarters, or since the opener in New Orleans one month before. Bob Lee bombed the Bears with 11 completions and 13 attempts, and he threw to everyone, his backs, his wide receivers, and his tight end, Jim Mitchell. Lee led the Falcons to five touchdowns against Chicago, and with a backfield of Bob Lee, Art Malone, and Dave Hampton, the Falcons had three of the most important elements of a potent offense. As Coach Norm Van Brocklin said after the game, it looks like we finally got ourselves a chucker. We look like a football team for a change. The Falcons finally had their second victory as they destroyed the Bears 46 to 6. For the Falcon faithful, it looked like another gruesome Sunday as a scoreless first period was quickly followed by a Chicago Bear touchdown. Number 26, Carl Garrett, not only scored and spiked, but he also awarded blocking guard Bob Newton a rare chance for a lineman spike. Then a miracle began to take form. Number 19, the same Bob Lee, whose sore elbow had betrayed him in previous weeks, began to find the range. 
Number 43, Dave Hampton, also came to life, both as a receiver and as the kind of runner who can score from anywhere on the field. Hampton's touchdown was Atlanta's first in 13 quarters, but on this particular day, it was only to be the beginning. On the next play, Nick Mickemeyer kicked off, and once again, Carl Garrett was on center stage for the Bears. Garrett's fumble resulted in three more points for the Falcons. And then on the next series, Bob Lee again demonstrated his arm is sound. Ken Burrow's easy touchdown made it 17 to six at the half Atlanta. In the third period, Bob Lee came out bombing. In all, Lee hit on 11 of 13 passes and led the Falcons to well over 400 yards in total offense. And after a while, a touchdown was so commonplace, it was not even worth a celebration. On the next series, Lee tossed to a wide open Art Malone for another easy touchdown. On the next series, it was Joe Prophet's turn to cash in, and the Bob Lee-led Falcons, who could not score a touchdown in more than three games, had three in four minutes. The final indignity for the Bears occurred in the fourth quarter. Van Brocklin's birds ran Gibron's Bears right out of Atlanta Stadium. As the Dutchman said after the game, we look like a football team today. That they did, but they'll have to do it more than once a month to keep their fans happy. Bob Lee's second start came the following week in San Diego, and once again the offense was devastating. The scoring started with a bolt up the middle by Art Malone and continued with two touchdowns by Dave Hampton. Four times the defense put Atlanta in scoring position with interceptions. The most spectacular was by number 22, rookie Rollin Lawrence, a defensive back from Tabor. Fullback Eddie Ray wrapped up the scoring with two touchdowns as the Falcons chalked up their first shutout ever, 41 to nothing. Dutch Van Brocklin and Swede Svare were teammates on the Rams 20 years ago, and as old friends, they could compare notes on the fans' attitude toward them as coaches. Last week, in the first official meeting of the Atlanta Falcons and San Diego Chargers, it was obvious from the outset that this was not to be the Chargers' day. No matter what the Chargers tried, no matter how simple, it backfired. Thirty-six times, rookie Dan Fouts tested the NFL's top-rated pass defense. Twenty-three times, he failed to connect. And four times, the Falcons intercepted and returned with an easy scoring range. Number 22, cornerback Roland Lawrence, a rookie from Tabor, enjoyed the longest play of the day, 81 yards. The Falcons scored at least one touchdown in every quarter. The first on a jump through the middle by Art Malone, number 25. The next two touchdowns were by Malone's running mate, Dave Hampton, number 43.
Two final touchdowns were put across by 240-pound Eddie Ray, number 44, as the Feaster Famine Falcons rolled to another lopsided victory, 41 to nothing. With their record now even at three and three, the Falcons next moved up the coast to San Francisco for the rematch with the 49ers, who used two quarterbacks, and both were treated with equal disdain by the rugged Falcon defense. In a bruising duel in the sun, Art Malone injured a knee and was sidelined for most of the remainder of the year, the first of several serious casualties to the Atlanta offense. But there are also bright moments. One came about when rookie place kicker Nick Mickemeyer boomed a 52-yard field goal, the longest in Falcon history. Perhaps the brightest light of all was Bob Lee, making his first professional appearance in his hometown. Lee hit on 11 of 13 passes, including five to Ken Burrow, who himself accounted for 164 yards and two touchdowns. The Falcons won their third straight and their second straight on the West Coast, where they had won only once in seven previous seasons. San Francisco had a new hometown hero, and his name was not John Brody. Both Atlanta and San Francisco had won by 40 point shutouts the previous Sunday. But last week in San Francisco, Dick Nolan's 49ers were out to win their fifth straight victory over Norm Van Brocklin's Falcons. Once again, Nolan's starting quarterback was Steve Spurrier, number 11. Spurrier could accomplish nothing against the fired up Falcons, who showed why they are ranked number one in the NFC in pass defense. When John Brody came to the rescue, Thames improved a little, but not much. After giving up 75 points in just three games, the Falcons in their last three have yielded only nine. For a while, the 49ers defense was almost as good as the game's only interception was pulled down by cornerback Bruce Taylor, number 44. In his first professional appearance in his hometown, Bob Lee took over the game with long passes to Ken Burrow, number 82. A strong arm quarterback like Bob Lee can throw long with confidence when he knows he has a receiver as aggressive as Ken Burrow. For the day, Burrow caught five passes for 164 yards and two touchdowns, while Bob Lee, behind good protection, hit on 11 of 13. The Falcons had beaten the 49ers for the first time in five tries, and there was at least one fan in San Francisco who loved every minute of it. returned home for the rematch with the powerful Rams, who got off to a 10 to nothing lead. But the Falcons weren't about to allow a repeat of their embarrassment in Los Angeles. touchdown was wiped out by a penalty, but Bob Lee just kept bringing the Falcons back. Trailing 
leading by one point with less than a minute left to play. Nick Mickemeyer, the five foot nine inch 10th round draft choice from Temple, kicked his fifth field goal in five tries. And for the first time ever, the Falcons had four straight wins and were now just one game behind first place Los Angeles in the NFC West. Half a season ago, when the Rams met the Falcons, Los Angeles won 31 to nothing. Last week, the Falcons needed to turn things around, and that they did. Trailing 10 to nothing in the first quarter, the turnabout was started by strong safety Ray Brown, number 34. Neither of the NFC's two top-rated passers had a great day, but Bob Lee definitely had a better one than John Hadle and it pays to have a little luck, too. Three times in the first half, Lee set up field goals for rookie place kicker Nick Mickemeyer, and three times the Hungarian-born booter connected, cutting the Ram advantage to 10-9 at the half. In the fourth quarter, Bob Lee turned to Dave Hampton for the game breaker. An offensive interference penalty forced Atlanta to settle for another field goal, but Bob Lee kept the Falcons coming. With less than a minute to play, Mickemeyer lined up at a 26 for his fifth and final attempt of the day. The 10th round draft pick from Temple had hit five for five and had scored all his team's points in perhaps the most important victory in Falcon history. For the first time ever, the Falcons had won four in a row and they still had not lost with Bob Lee at quarterback. For the Rams, their three game lead had been cut to one and suddenly there was at least a suspicion of doubt. Pat, our featured performer of the week in the West is number 19, Bob Lee, the quarterback for the Atlanta Falcons. This footage from last week in Philadelphia, Lee is 6'3", 195, and his fifth year from the University of Pacific, a 16th round pick of Minnesota back in 1968. The Falcons traded, of course, for him. They got Lonnie Warwick, they gave up Bob Berry, and next year's number one draft choice, and Lee makes it look like a pretty good deal. Got some uh, career record as a starter. He won seven out of nine in, with Minnesota. And in Atlanta, he's won five straight without a loss. Overall, that's 12 out of 14 starts. An unusual young quarterback, the coach, Van Brockman calls the plays, but Bob Lee, they say, is the leader in the huddle. And last week, of course, he led the Falcons over the Eagles 44 to 27. ninth week, the Falcons took their four-game winning streak into Philadelphia. The Atlanta defense had given up only one touchdown in its last four games. But now they were up against the NFL's top-ranked passing attack. And their old friend Roman Gabriel and his gigantic league-leading receiver Harold Carmichael led the revitalized Eagles to 27 points against the NFL's top-ranked pass defense. In a high-scoring contest, the punting game proved to be surprisingly important as John James finally bottled up the Eagle attack with the season's most perfect coffin corner kick. The superiority of the Falcons' special teams was also apparent in the returning of kicks as more than 100 yards in punt returns were accumulated by one man, number 34, Ray Brown.
Time after time, the Atlanta special teams had the offense in good scoring position. And time after time, Bob Lee put points on the board. 24 in the fourth quarter, 44 in all. The Falcons won their fifth straight with the help of the sixth and seventh touchdowns of the year by Ken Burrow. But unfortunately for Burrow and the Falcons, the neck injury meant that they would be his last touchdowns of the year. Rookie head coach Mike McCormick heads one of the hottest clubs in pro football, the Flying Philadelphia Eagles, winners of three of their last four games. McCormick and his assistants have transformed the Eagles into a cohesive, happy, and talented ball club that, despite a slow start, still is very much in the running for first place in the NFC East. The wild card spot in the National Conference may be a more realistic way to make the playoffs for Philadelphia, but the very fact that the playoffs can be discussed at all indicates just how far the Eagles have come since last year's sorry season. This team is explosive, and it is very, very young. Thirteen rookies have made the roster, and the amazing total of seven and sometimes eight are starters. The Eagles are hot, but the team they face today is even hotter, for the Atlanta Falcons have won four straight games. Their coach, Norm Van Brocklin, is a familiar figure in Philadelphia. He quarterbacked the Eagles to the 1960 championship. The Dutchman has his Falcons in second place in the NFC's Western Division, just one game behind the leading Rams. The Falcons began the season with feast or famine style. They either won or lost by large margins. Now they seem to have settled down. The biggest reason for their newfound consistency is Bob Lee, their new quarterback. Since the former Viking took over for Dick Shiner, Atlanta is undefeated. An interesting feature of this game today is that it matches the NFC's number one passing team, the Eagles, against the conference's number one passing defense, the Falcons. A clash between two high-flying birds of a different feather. On the first play, quarterback Roman Gabriel dropped back to pass, looked downfield, then dumped the ball in the flat to tight end Charlie Young. When the 230-pound rookie gets the ball, things happen. Young battled for 12 yards and a first down on the 10. Two plays later, Gabriel tried the same side, this time to Tom Sullivan, who made it inside the flag for a touchdown. Philadelphia had drawn first blood, 7-0. After Lee had passed them into Eagle territory, tackle Bill Sandeman continually blocked number 71. Atlanta began to move on the ground. Eddie Ray, number 44, playing in place of the injured Art Malone, drew first blood by gouging out yardage through the Eagle defense. Next, it was Dave Hampton, playing despite a dislocated elbow. Finally, it was Harmon Wages, number five, running hard like his hero, Paul Horning, once did for Green Bay. Despite its patched up ground game, Atlanta found it could run on the Eagles. Their fourth straight attempt, this one by Ray, got them into the end zone to tie the game. The view from the top showed Ray stumbled, ran into his own interference, then recovered to just edge the ball over the goal line for the tying touchdown. On the next series, Gabriel double pumped and tested Atlanta's league leading secondary. He lost. Free safety Clarence Ellis, number 29, made the steal, then made a 48-yard return.
The former Notre Dame Stars interception was the 13th for the Falcons this season. More importantly, it gave Atlanta a great opportunity, and they grabbed it at the start of the second quarter when Lee faked to Ray, then lofted a pass to Ken Burrow all by himself in the corner of the end zone. Atlanta had scored its second touchdown in the span of four minutes to go ahead 14-7. into Falcon territory where Tom Dempsey kicked a 34-yarder for three points. It reduced the Philadelphia deficit to seven once more. Dempsey to attempt a kick from 48 yards out. Dempsey's long-range field goal brought the Eagles to within four points of the Falcons and gave their fans much to cheer about for Philadelphia's been an explosive second-half team this season. Atlanta's four-point lead seems shaky indeed. The Falcons open the second half with a brutally efficient ground game. Notice the blocks on number 75, Dennis Wergoski, and number 84, Richard Harris, and a gaping wound in the Eagles' defensive line for Eddie Ray to power through. Even when the Falcons made a mistake, it went their way. Ray got another hole, but he fumbled right into the hands of Al Dodd, who tacked on eight more yards. With the Eagles now conscious of the run, Lee made a play fake to Hampton, rolled away from pressure by Richard Harris, and hit Larry Mialik for 17 yards. Alex Spike did not count, for he had been knocked out of bounds four yards short of the end zone. It was four yards the Falcons could have used, but the Eagle defense, led by number 85, middle linebacker Marlon McKeever, would not allow the touchdown. With a fourth and goal at the one, Ben Brockman up for the field goal, and Atlanta led 20 to 13. Fake to Sullivan. Sullivan chopped down blitzing linebacker Greg Brezina, and Bulash slipped into Brezina's vacated area. The Falcons, who had given up just 22 points in their last four games, had now yielded 20 in one game, as the Eagles' high-powered offense came back to tie at 20. Watch as Ray Brown takes a step to the right to get the Eagles moving in that direction, then goes left to get through the Atlanta return wall. Hunter Tom McNeil finally got to Brown after a 41-yard return, but the Falcons had the ball on the Philadelphia 42-yard line. But they could advance no farther. Lee hit Burrow on a sideline pattern, but notice Burrow's feet clearly hitting the sideline, causing an incompletion. A penalty cost the Falcons a field goal try, but that proved to be a break, for punter John James trotted out the old coffin corner kick and hit it perfectly. James's punt went out on the one-foot line, and the play proved to be a turning point in the game. The Eagles were now forced to move literally from the shadow of their own goalposts. If the Falcon defense could hold the Eagles without a first down, they could capture good field position once more. Falcons held, and after a punt, got possession on the Eagle 43 going into the fourth quarter. After moving to a first down, Lee cut linebacker Steve Zabel and safety Randy Logan in a blitz, leaving Burrow wide open in the right flat. Then Lee went back to Hampton, who poured through another big hole in the Eagle defensive line for 10 more yards. repeat we can see that Zabel was caught in a blitz again he simply ran by Hampton and Hampton ran into Zabel's vacated area 
From the two-yard line, Lee went at the Eagle right side again, and when win number 71 was pushed back, Ray drove over for the score. The Falcons had regained the lead 27-20, but the Eagles have been known to come back before. This time, they couldn't do it, however, as Gabriel's first pass deflected off a receiver and was intercepted, setting the Falcons up on the Eagle 21. The Eagles nearly got the break back, but Hampton's fumble was ruled after the whistle, and the Falcon drive lived. helped keep the Atlanta drive alive when he was nearly sacked by Harris, but still got a pass off to Burrow. The play lost a yard, but Lee had saved the eight or nine yard sack that can stall a drive. Two plays later, he was passing again, and Ray carried a screen to the one yard line. came up a yard short, but on the next play, Lee again attacked the right side of the Eagle defense, and Harmon Wages got the score. The Falcons now led by 14 points, with eight and one half minutes to go. Brown's 57-yard return left him winded, but it set up Nick Mickemeyer's 14th field goal in 15 tries in the Falcons' recent win streak. The competitive aspect was going out of the game as the Falcons had rushed to a 37-20 lead. Gabriel went back to Carmichael again. Mark Nordquist, number 68, got a good block on Mike Tilleman, and Gabriel, now able to stand straight and tall in the pocket, hit Carmichael with a perfect pass for the score. catch brought the Falcons a 44-27 lead. But the Eagles still had time for one more possession, and fittingly, the game ended with Gabriel still trying to scratch up more points for the Eagles. But Zimmerman's bobble was ruled an incomplete pass, not a fumble, and despite Carmichael being hoagy on the spot, his touchdown run did not count. Though they had gone down fighting, the Eagles had gone down, and their 44-27 loss to Atlanta all but snuffed out any playoff hopes that had been dredged up by the Eagles' recent strong showing. But the Falcons now look like a very strong contender for the playoffs as their win streak stretched to five games. Quarterback Bob Lee has been the starter for all five wins and appears to be the answer to Atlanta's early season offensive problems. The Falcon defense, though it gave up 27 points to the Scrappy Eagles, is tough too. And this combination of potent offense and tough when it has to be defense may land the Falcons a playoff appearance for the first time in their history. In Minnesota, he had won seven games and nine starts over a four-year period. But in Minnesota, he was only Bob Lee. In Atlanta, he was General Robert M. Lee and the good right arm of Commander-in-Chief Norm Van Brocklin. For the Vikings, the Georgia Peach, Fran Tarkenton, led the only undefeated team in the NFL to an early lead with a touchdown pass to another Georgian, John Gilliam. 
But this particular Monday night did not belong to Tarkenton and his powerful Vikings, but to General Lee and his powerful Falcon. Dave Hampton's touchdown thrust the Falcons into the lead, and Atlanta Stadium exploded. The explosion had not yet subsided when General Lee pulled off the NFL's play of the year. Eddie Ray's touchdown gave Atlanta a 17-7 lead from which the undefeated Vikings never recovered. By winning perhaps the best played game of the entire NFL season, the Falcons had now won six consecutive victories. The Vikings were no longer the hottest team in pro football. The Falcons were. Flushing Meadows, home of the Mets, Jets, and last week, the Wets. Yes, Flushing Meadows was the scene as the Atlanta Falcons tiptoed into Shea Stadium in lovely, clean, white uniforms. The Falcons are hot, so hot that Hall of Fame player Norm Van Brocklin now seems to tower over the coaching fraternity as well. Joe Namath was starting his first game in recent memory, but the natural mud surface was to be the great equalizer. And both teams wound up with almost exactly the same statistics, including almost exactly the same number of good natural mud baths. Claude Humphrey, number 87, helped Joe Namath inspect the condition of the field a little more closely. Not to be outdone, the Jets helped Bob Lee get a better look at the interesting cumulonimbus formations. Bob Lee and rookie Tom Jardine then gave the Jets a lesson in beating the Blitz. Jardine's score gave the Falcons the early lead, but Joe Namath brought the Jets right back, and for a while, there were glimpses of the good old days at Shea Stadium. Namath capped an old-fashioned 13-play drive with a third down pass to Rich Caster for the tying touchdown. In the second quarter, the Falcons scored once again after a New York fumble at the one-yard line, and then again when Bob Lee found his other rookie-wide receiver, Lewis Neal, somewhat open over the middle. Sometimes the zone doesn't work out as diagrammed, and early in the third quarter, Joe Namath had his shot at an easy touchdown against Atlanta's pass defense. Eddie Bell's rump brought the Jets within one point at 21-20, but thereafter the league's leading pass defense shut down Joe Willie Mudshoes. Strong safety Ray Brown had two of Atlanta's three interceptions as the Falcons rolled to their seventh straight victory. With three games to go, the Falcons already have assured their highest scoring season, and with eight wins, the best record in their history. As for Joe Namath, he still hasn't defeated a team with a winning record since, well, you remember Super Bowl III, don't you? Week 11 found the Falcons in a swampland called Flushing Meadows, Long Island, to face the New York Jets and a fellow they called Joe Willie. It seemed that no matter how atrocious the conditions and the pressure, this Joe Willie guy was still dangerous. As they had for seven consecutive weeks, the men of the Atlanta defense rose to the occasion, and when it counted, they throttled Joe and his Jets. Bob 
Bob Lee again came up with the big plays. This time with two rookie wide receivers who had replaced injured Ken Burrow and Al Dodd. First, Tom Gurdine scored his first pro touchdown. And then Lewis Neal scored his first. The Falcons had won their seventh straight, 28-20, and assured the best season record in Falcon history. The Falcons got a break when number 87 Claude Humphrey intercepted a Joe Ferguson screen pass deep down in Buffalo territory. But the most the Falcons could produce was a three-pointer, and the frustration had just begun as a Bob Lee to Jim Mitchell spectacular brought the Falcons down close again. One play later, they failed on fourth and one, and the Bills' defense had held. An interception returned by number 27, Tom Hayes. But Hayes' performance was the only Atlanta achievement worthy of praise, as for the greater part of the day. Since Bob Lee took over at quarterback, the Falcons were undefeated and had scored their most points ever. As Lee himself said, the way we're playing now, I don't know if anybody can stop us. But then along came the Buffalo Bills and a man named O.J. Simpson, who ran the ball 24 times for 137 yards, and the Falcons' winning streak had ended at seven. In the next to last week of the season, the Falcons ran up an early 10-point lead on the St. Louis Cardinals, and dreams of the playoffs were still alive. Against Atlanta, the victory-starved Cardinals came up with their best game of the season. Five turnovers helped set up six field goals and 20 points by St. Louis place kicker Jim Bakken. Losing to St. Louis, the Falcons' record fell to eight and five, and their hopes for the playoffs had all but slipped away. In the opener, the Saints made the errors and the Falcons made the points, 62 of them. Last Sunday, it looked like history might repeat itself when Dwayne Benson smothered punter Steve O'Neill and quarterback Bob Lee twice set up Atlanta touchdowns with his passing. Leading 14 to nothing and with encouraging news from out of town, the Falcons appeared to be sitting pretty. But the Saints stopped making mistakes and they also stopped the Falcons from further point making. When the Atlanta offense broke down, the New Orleans offense took over as number 12, second-year quarterback Bobby Scott from Tennessee took the Saints to a score when he scrambled until he found Bob Newland in the end zone. Fourteen to 10 was as close as the Saints could come, and the rest of the day was a battle between Dave Hampton and the 1,000-yard Barry. Hampton carried 27 times for 84 yards, but the Saints knew he was coming, and they stopped him just three yards short of the magic number when after six consecutive carries, Hampton failed to convert a fourth down run into a first down at the New Orleans nine-yard line. For the second straight year, Hampton was less than five yards short of 1,000, and his team, with a nine and five record this time, was just one game short of the playoffs. In the season's final game, Bob Lee led the Falcons to their ninth straight win over New Orleans and a final record of nine and five, the Falcons' best ever. But the big story was Dave Hampton and his quest for a thousand yard season. With another year of seasoning for number seven, backup quarterback Pat Sullivan, and with the return of game-breaking wide receiver Ken Burrow, number 82, 
And with another year of experience for improving young players like number 84, Tom Gurdine, and others like Lewis Neal, Joe Washington, Greg Marks, Rosie Manning, Ken Mitchell, Rollin Lawrence, Ray Easterling, Larry Mialik, Nick Bebout, and Ted Frisch, and most of all, with the established leadership of quarterback Bob Lee, the realization of one of Norm Van Brocklin's long-standing goals is near at hand. In 1974, the Atlanta Falcons will have a quality player at every position and all the elements of a victorious future.